Hi, my name is Vinay, and uh, I'm here today to talk about uh, extending libbpf for uh, Kubernetes use case, which I hope you find interesting. Uh, the agenda for today is we'll look at this cloud-based development environment use case. We came across this a year ago uh, with a company called Octato, which is in the business of doing cloud data development, uh, offering a service to build your workload in the cloud. We'll look at the problem that they had and how eBPF helped solve this problem and uh, some of the pain points I encountered while implementing the POC for this as a solution. And based off that, uh, I have a couple of uh, suggestions, the proposal for extending libbpf helper. Uh, we'll take a look at that and see if that makes sense. Uh, a couple of more use cases that I came across which could justify the need for this. So let's get started with that. Cloud-based development environment, this use case, so why does it matter? Why do we need it? Uh, uh, consider this use case where today you have, a, you, let's say you have a dev team of 20 people or something. You want them to be productive in you know, building, writing code and building code, and you buy them like uh, M2 MacBook Pros, which is like 4,000 a piece maybe. So that's uh, quite a bit of money. An alternative way to do it is buy these more economical laptops that are good enough for building code, for writing code using your favorite IDE, but the heavy lifting that's building the code and running those uh, running that running tests a battery of tests against this code you can do that in the cloud in a kubernetes pod that's running on a high powered system uh, the advantage of doing this is that uh, not only do you get the team to share the cloud capacity not everyone is expected to be using it at the same time for building and running tests so you get to share that and then you also share the config so you'll not run into the situation where it works on your machine, but you check it in and then it doesn't work, uh, which wastes time. So there is a value proposition there and based on which these companies are offering this as a service. And uh, uh, as far as I know, it's picking up in popularity and as alternative to high powered, high priced development systems. So the, sis the, the flow is essentially you write your code, asking the code into, in this case, uh, asking the code to a Kubernetes pod and the Kubernetes pod takes care of doing this uh, the heavy lifting. We presented this use case uh, in the last North America KubeCon, and there's a link to that if you're interested. Now, this is great, but how do you tell Kubernetes that you want to have this dev environment in the cloud? The way to do that is by uh, specifying, giving this pod spec to Kubernetes. I'm not sure if everyone knows this, so I'll just go over this a little bit. Uh, pod spec, what you see here is it tells the Kubernetes API that this is the name of the pod. I want this to I want to schedule this. Okay, that's better. <laughs> okay, I want to schedule this pod uh, in the cloud on a system that has at least four CPUs and five gig of memory. With that, Kubernetes is able to take that spec and then pull your container from the Docker from the repository, image repository, and then run that workload. In this case, what I'm showing is a build environment that can build Kubernetes. Now, once it's up and running, there, this is great, but uh, up until very recently, Kubernetes did not have the capability to modify the resources that you requested at the time of creation of the pod. If you have the pod that's running and no workload is being, there is no build or no test running, then that capacity is wasted. It's reserved for you and it uh, remains wasted, which is a waste of resources and money. Uh, what's worse is, let's say you start running the test and you realize that, okay, five gig is not enough, I need six. Well, tough luck, you have to kill the whole thing and reschedule the pod that's six gig or more and then run it again. So that again wastes time and money. Now, we recently fixed that. In Kubernetes 127, uh, we have added the ab ability to resize the pod without having to kill the workloads that it, that's running in it. So you can uh, dynamically change the CPU and memory resources up or down based on the need. There is a project, there is a tool called Vertical Pod Autoscaler which does precisely that. What it does is it monitors the CPU memory usage uh, on an ongoing basis using some APIs. And when it sees the workload is, needs more CPU or memory, it allocates, it uh, makes a recommendation and is able to update that as well. And uh, vice versa when it sees the underutilized pod. Now, this particular use case, the cloud-based dev environment use case that uh, I'm talking about here, it's different from your normal, like, okay, you have Nginx workload or database pod that's running, and as the number of requests increase, then you need 
more memory, which is growing more slowly. This is very spiky in nature. You can imagine that uh, your request level is at one, you're not using the system, but the moment you hit a make command, you'll need a lot more memory and CPU. And by the time vertical pod autoscaler reacts to this, we end up, we may end up in a situation where it gets own kill because you're exceeding your reserve quota. And uh, what we ideally want for this is something like this, where you see the make command, you want to increase the capacity if it is available to what the, the build system or the tests need. And that way you are assured that for the duration of your test run, uh, things will continue to work well and things won't break down. This, uh, we called it as the proactive approach. So this is where eBPF comes in. So let's take a look at this example here. I've intentionally set the memory requests here to 50 meg, which is sufficient for just running a bare bones pod, but it's not useful uh, to do any real work. If you want to build or run tests, this is not sufficient. And a very crude way of fixing that with eBPF is to, as you all know, monitor the exec VE system call, trace everything that goes through it, and then if you see the make command, you resize the pod. This little piece of code fits in one PowerPoint slide, but that's about the only thing that's good about it. What we really want to do is something like this. We want to trace the commands that we are interested in. In this case, use the make command. Here is the example. And only for the containers that we are interested in. So there might be 100 containers or uh, 200 containers, 1,000 containers running in the system, but you're only interested in that one build container which uh, you're going to build on, and you want to resize. Uh, it, can, it can be issuing a lot of commands. It can, be, it can be doing a lot of things, but only when it does the make command, you want to use that, uh, trace that event, and then use that event to resize the pod. Quick, quick and, question? Yeah. Sorry, over here. Um, so yeah, that, that would certainly work. Um, Obviously, if you have like a lot of other things running on the host, then you're just going to have CPU overcommit, right? And you're going to have issues. Um, so this is something that Sketty XT could potentially help with. Like this is sort of probably more related to the overcommit. Excuse me, the uh, the soft affinity that uh, that um, How and I were discussing yesterday, where yeah, you you know you can assign some CPUs to the C group or to the pod, but if the rest of the machine is underutilized, underutilized, then you would just take those CPUs and you have like a highly parallel make job. Yeah, I think Sket. EXT from what, um, I've been more of a user of eBPF, so I don't know all the details that, uh, to the depth that you all know, but my take was that it, it can help you uh, make use of uh, unutilized CPU cycles and give it to pods, but uh, does that help with memory? No, 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 I mean memory, no, that you'd have to change that, but um, yeah, uh, but yeah, I mean, if for, for, for your increase, you're increasing the number of CPUs as well in your example, right, so. That was one of the aspects, yeah. I stole that slice from my co-speaker from KubeCon, sorry. Yeah, <laughs> but I really wanted it to be memory. Yeah, so I was just, just pointing out for, for, I think the more general solution to like make or whatever, like if you wanted to increase a, a pod would be probably to do that in the scheduler um, instead of in, yeah. the, uh, in the config, but just step, I mean, it hasn't landed yet, so, <laughs> so oh. something maybe to experiment with there if it would be interesting. Yeah, I think it's good to have an additional solution there. Uh, does that uh, also, like respect C group limits. Uh, yeah, so the CPU control. So you can you can implement a scheduler that that um that in implements like CPU max and all of the CPU control. Um, yeah. Uh, that's what uh, one of the example schedulers I mentioned, flat CG. We mm -hmm. build like a flat. We we do this recursive uh, walking of all the C groups, and we build a flat hierarchy so that you you know you don't have to take the overhead of uh, of uh, walking C groups um, when you're when you're choosing tasks, yeah, right. you could use that as an example. It's it's a little bit heuristic, you know. It, it has some corner cases where it won't honor the C group limits, but you could do that. Um, and then if that's what you want, that combined with um, with like a soft affinity would probably get you pretty far. Okay, so there is uh, this exposes another. This introduces another new alternative to at least handle the CPU uh, needs that. I think that would be useful for at least another use case that's out there which relies purely on the CPU uh, parts of it. What remains, is, what remains to be identified is how do we uh, expose this to the user, the user's ability to specify that this is gonna be my min and max, it might change after a certain, I think this, the use case here was more based on deterministic, like okay, you know this, these kind of events, uh, like hitting a make command will and will need you will need to resize the pod and 
I guess the same thing can be, yeah, I think that can be used to trigger the uh, the SCADI XG as well. I can see that as a potential you, use case. You would still need to increase the C group limits, right? Because otherwise you just bypassing Kubernetes policy. Yeah, so I, I mean, I guess it depends on the use case. Like usually if you have C group um, CPU limits, it's because you don't want one C group to like overutilize the host and starve other, other tasks, right? But if you have something like soft affinity, it would only kick in if the rest of the CPUs were, were idle. So I mean, like you have to worry about memory bandwidth, like there's other implications to being able to run, but. And you could, yeah, you could always say, no, you can't use this, you know, you can't, you can't exceed your limits, but I think typ the typical use case is like, you're, you have like a, a CPU affinity in one C group and a separate affinity in the other, or, uh, or you have, you know, maybe something less, um, less uh, hard-coded than that, and you just don't want one, like one C group with, with 20 tasks to exceed uh, another C group with 10. You want to have like rough sharing of, yeah. Let, let, let's take it offline, but I, I guess my point is that like C, Kubernetes is the one that does the scheduling, so it uses C groups to kind of uh, do the scheduling okay. and control the resources. So, yeah. yeah, yeah, no, no, so, so conflicting with like Kubernetes heuristics and Kubernetes load balancing is a different problem. I'm just saying if like, if, I think the general solution to I want this 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 pod has capacity. It could run because the host has more capacity. Would be to use a scheduler, but your point is well taken as well. Yeah. I think uh, yeah. If we want to go down that route, it'll be a significant amount of change to Kubernetes itself to switch from, or at least extend um, the C group is is at its max, but this this could use more CPU and uh, use SCADI XT program it to give more resources to it, I Ma guess. Maybe on that, so, so, so like what Kubernetes is exposing today, right, is like um, CPU or memory request, like make sure that there is at least this much bandwidth on the, the, the machine, and then you've got the max, right, which is like don't exceed this this limit. So yeah. those are the, like the very high level kind of constraints. Right. So yeah. w if there's something different we want to actually implement that doesn't fit those semantics, that's interesting. Uh, if this fits into those semantics and you can say, oh, this is like a piece of the cog to actually make that efficient, then that's mm -hmm. also interesting. Well, so, okay, so if you want to increase the number of CPUs that a pod is using, would that feed into Kubernetes and then they might load balance you to like a different host or something like that? Yeah, like effect, like scheduling, like how many of different applications they'll then pack onto the different nodes. So, okay, so, so I mean, it's, yeah, there, there's a few different ways to do it, but. The the easy the, like the the easy benefit of soft affinity is that you can tr it's a, it's essentially like a um, what's the word I'm looking for uh, it's like a it's a lossy way of of getting extra capacity without having to do any of that right because like if you have if you have a Kubernetes pod that's given like half of a host and another one's given the other half of the host the point of, of soft affinity is that you could use whatever cores the other one wasn't using and you don't have to like it, basically it's like a it's it's like a soft guarantee like if you really need to have more more CPUs for the pod, then yeah, you would increase the number and you would get you would get migrated. But for like a specific build job, like if the pod can do multiple things, it feels like it's maybe a little bit more robust to not have to like be migrated to a different host or whatnot, right? Like soft affinity, maybe it's like a it's like a first attempt or something. I don't know. But um, yeah, if you wanted to if you wanted to tie that in with a load balancer, it would be a different story. I, I haven't even thought about how that would work. So the load balancing, or in this case, the Kubernetes scheduling, it comes a uh, layer before uh, the, the workload scheduling is different from the scheduling of the actual tasks in the workload. Um, that, uh, that happens at, uh, even before the workload gets started up. The Kubernetes scheduler has a big, has a view of the whole cluster, and its job is to uh, look at you know, find the best home for the pod that you're, 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 people are guessing. When they set this, they don't know what they really need. Mm -hmm. That's the main thing. And as far as CPU goes, uh, um, doesn't today's uh, fair scheduler also take care of this? Let's say if we, the recommendation is not to set limits. Uh, in that case, whatever capacity is available in the system, let's say you have a 32 CPU system, but you requested four. Four is reserved for you, but if you go to like, 16 or 28, 32, you will get that. Uh, C CPU is a reclaimable resource, right? If, you, if you're, it, it's not like memory where you give it away and then it's hard to get it back until the process releases it. Yeah, yeah, I mean, but like if, if you have like a, an affinity of five CPUs, then CFS is not gonna give you any more than five CPUs, right? And so a lot of the time, that's what people do with C groups yeah. because the CPU controller is, is not very accurate and it's, it's very high overhead. At least for Meta, that's been our experience with it. 
are you talking about so CPU sets like reserved CPU? Yeah, yeah, yeah. CPUs? Like, okay. like, it, like it's, it would be a bug right. for a task that like to be scheduled on CPU zero if it wasn't in its CPU mass. Yeah, that has not been in the scope of my work so far. It will okay. come probably. I'm not going to do it. Somebody else have will do, will do it. So, so yeah, uh, I mean, I think I think this is like if you have a pod that like traditionally uses five CPUs and it's scheduled with another one that uses five and it's like a C, you know a ten CPU host. Yeah. Like soft affinity would be a way for you to to be able to usually get all the like like it would be a way for you to not underutilize the host and yeah. to get most of what you need most of the time. But if you need a guarantee of more CPUs, it won't it won't help you. Yeah, I think there is a use case for it, in Kubernetes world. It's called static CPU manager policy mm -hmm. where whole unit CPUs are affinitized. Yeah. This the implementation that's currently there is uh, it doesn't take that into account. It could be running on any CPU. It's fine. Okay. The workloads that need to be affinated, like Numa and all that there, Ericsson, I believe, if I remember correctly, they wanted that facility, and uh, um, we kind of, to just keep the scope main, um, manageable, didn't take that into uh, into the scope of the project at this point, or at least what got done so far. Okay. Yeah, sounds but good. yeah, okay. uh, future extensions, I can easily see this being a great, great thing, because uh, if you can, without having to do some whole lot of circus. Uh, this can easily, I can see that, uh, honestly, I need to digest a lot of this. So. Yeah, yeah, of course. <laughs> well, we, can, we can talk about it more offline. I mean, yeah, there's, there's yeah. also the, the CPU controller, which, which, which is aside from the, the affinity thing that we could talk about if you're having, like yeah. if, you're, if you're hitting issues in the controller with like limits and stuff like that, which isn't yeah. the same as the affinity thing that could help as well. Okay, um, yeah. yeah. Okay, thanks. Thank you. So, uh, it, it, I'm kind of skimming over a lot of the Kubernetes stuff here, uh, and if uh, you have any questions, please interrupt any time. Uh, where was I? Okay. So we're talking about how uh, we leveraged eBPF, the trace points, to do this resizing uh, pretty much, I call it just-in-time resizing. And the real, a better way to do this is to use uh, to trace only the commands that are that you're interested in. In this case, in this example, it's make, and mm -hmm. only do it on the container. This way, you're not flooding. It's uh, much more efficient. The issue here is uh, how to get the C group ID given the container ID, and the one that you see up here, the yellow screen, this screenshot. This is for C group V2. It's easier, and this is for C group V1. Now, this is not a big deal, but it's not a very trivial thing either. It's, uh, it, took, it might take some looking around and you don't want to repeat this code all over the place. And this is, I thought, is something that could be improved upon. And uh, once we get the C group ID, this is what we probably would do. Uh, not the best code, but uh, it's something like what we want to do to uh, trace the points. We get the C group ID. If it's in the BPF map, then you know it's a container that you want to trace, and then look at the command that that's being executed. If it's something that you're interested in, then you issue a perf event, and then the, let the user mode program that's watching for these perf events handle that. So this is a much uh, this is probably the cleaner way to do things. And as part of doing this, uh, I did at the time. I mean, you see that I'm trying to do this ugly string compare. That's because the library that I was using did not have BPF, STR, and CMP. It's there now. I checked like a few days ago. It's there, so this is not an issue anymore. That brings me to the proposed libbpf helper extensions. Um, given this context, uh, what, what I think is a good idea is to add these two helpers. One is BPF uh, get container C group ID. So this takes a container ID. Uh, which is in the C group file system. Uh, you under sysfs C group CPU, you have this. Uh, this is what a Kubernetes container ID would look like. You scan for that and then return the inode number, which is your C group ID. And it's uh, inverse operation. I'm not sure if this can be. If this is something that can be useful for Aditi's use case that we discussed yesterday. I, I, I could be wrong, but my I, I think the container ID is specific to the runtime. So don't they? Use like all kinds of different notations for this stuff. Yeah. Um, so we have this code in Tetragon. We implement it um, just because we need it. <laughs> yeah. Um, Is this the right way to do it, though? I wasn't really sure. I I saw that it worked across multiple distributions, or kernel versions, and I was so, okay. So it's 
it's not necessarily the right way to do it, yeah. but as of now, it's the only one. <laughs> and like it's 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 not great, and it works. Yeah. Like so, the 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 proper way would be to so there is this when you start a container, yeah. there is a specification where you can insert hooks into the runtime, yes. and so. If you can do that, that's a better way because yeah. like whenever a container starts, you can get its C group ID. So right. in, in Tetragon, we have support for that. Okay. But we also have support for that in case, for whatever reason, the runtime hook doesn't work. Right. Um, and, and so... What runtime are you using? Hmm? What runtime are you using? Is this container D or... Uh, so the, the, the hooks are... OCI specified, yeah, and I've tested this on Container D, and I think it also works on Cryo. Yeah, okay. The, there are some tricks to make it work on Docker, but yeah. I mean, I don't know if you want to, but you could just use Tetragon with a K probe hook, and then you could also get the the namespace filtering as well, right? Which I think will be useful, right? Like. You may may only want to do this in specific namespaces. In okay. Kubernetes namespaces, not kernel namespaces, right? Yeah. Um, and there, there's filtering for that in the latest stuff too. So you could say, you know, if it's uh, whatever, you know, um, preferred user namespace, which will give you more cores. If you're the least important user namespace, then you get, you know, maybe you don't get them or something, right? So um, it, it's worth looking at at least if you if you can't use it directly, maybe look at the how we, how we do it, I don't know. So um, the short answer seems to be that we should not rely on the C group FS inode number. That's not necessarily going to be w something that works for every use case or every runtime. So the, the thing I would say is that I, <laughs> I don't think this be belongs in libpf. Okay. Just because like libpf doesn't care about container IDs. Um, yeah, yeah. I, I, I'd also say like it, it's this is not the only Kubernetes thing you need. Yeah. So does libbpf start want to start learning all of the other things that Kubernetes needs? So containers, namespaces, pods, labels. Yeah. Like like as soon as you start adding this stuff, you end up adding a whole set of stuff. And I think libbpf is about loading libb you know programs, not about trying to understand Kubernetes runtime. Yeah, but that kind know, of the maintainers are here, so maybe they'll. No, that thought occurred to me. This is like wag the dog kind of situation. Well, it, it, it actually <laughs> looks to me like what you want is actually BPF side helpers. Yeah. So like you want to do this from the BPF side, from like the kind of kernel side, right? Uh, yeah, it's like I want to make it easier for. No, no, like doing, the, yeah, the, yeah. It, it's important distinction. Do you want to do this from the user space or from the BPF program? from the user space at this point. Okay. So, so right, your user space application is calling this to get the C group ID. Yeah, so when you create the container, uh, the flow is that the node agent, in this case kubelet, sees the pod spec that I showed earlier, and it calls into the runtime, uh, this is container D or cryo, to set up the pod sandbox, it's the first step. So set up pod, span, pod sandbox, CNI, add all that stuff happens. And the very first step is to create this infra container. And that's the C group ID. We, uh, well, that's not the C group ID that we want in this case. But as we start creating new containers, one of those containers we care about, the build container in this case. That's the C group ID we're looking to get. So and okay. well, why would this be in libvpf? I mean, this is like purely, like, this, like what does that have to do with vpf, right? If so this is a case where we have no, it's uh, Linux specific. I give you that. And in the Linux uh, C group uh, files, the, the sys fsc group file system, we create there's a hierarchy for C group v1, C group v2. There are some differences, but there's a hierarchy, and it's pretty predictable. And no, you can get the container it? ID there. No, but right, but you could just do that in like like add a li like another library that like like searches for C group. Like I, I'm just genuinely asking, like, what does it have to do with BPF, right? This is a C group thing, not a BPF thing. It seems like. Um, yes. Uh, it, it is a C group thing. No, no, sorry. Well, it is a C group thing. What we are looking to do is get the, 
Yeah, okay, I'm kind of a little lost now. Uh, so are these two separate things? Uh, the BPF portion of it is, is a consumer. The BPF code is a consumer. But to feed that BPF code, which we need the C group ID. So you need what, so you need to get a C group ID and add it, and like your your BPF program needs to see that, is what you're saying. Correct. Yes. So, so you could just set like a variable in your program, right? And then just set it like open the program, look up the ID in the user space, set set that variable. LibBPF will do the relocations for you. How? And then, how do you look up the ID? Is there another way to given a container? In this case, let's say this path uh, sysfs C group some path underneath that. Is there another? existing way of getting the C group ID just from that or? You can get that. Well. So uh, we have something similar in Cilium. Uh, yeah. If I understand your use case correctly, you can get pod C group path. Yeah. And then to convert that path to C group ID, you can use the syscall call name to handle that. Oh, OK. And then so you'll get the C group way. ID in the user space. Uh, yeah. From BPF side, there are a couple of helpers that are available. Uh, I can give pointers to you. And sure. so that way you can share the C group ID context between user space and uh, okay. BPF data path. Does that take care of both C group V1, V2, or is that something uh, C group to ID user? is specific to C group V2. So C group V1, you'll probably have to use class ID or something. Yeah. Right. So that's kind of the motivation for, you know, have one place to get this and not have the user worry about or the, it's not a big deal, uh, but this is something, it's not, it would be nice to have. It just, it, yeah, I mean, uh, it certainly seems useful. It just seems like what you really need is a way to like map IDs from user space to kernel space, right? To to to, to BPF program. So yeah, we yeah, you just don't, I don't think this is like an abstraction that would belong in the BPF. Yeah, okay. so so it's it's definitely useful code. Like yeah. we have exactly the same code in Tetragon, just for this exact same reason. Yeah, but like I I, I wouldn't expect like the BPF to care about it. Okay. Um, I guess uh, LibBPF is not the best place to do it. I mean, the, the other thing, right, as soon as you run this for a while, you're going to go, oh, it's racy. I'm missing a few makes here and there. And then you're going to have token to OCI, right? Like, that's exactly the path that Tetragon took, right? It's like, we did this. We tried yeah. it for a while. Yeah. It was racy. We missed some things. And we said, OK, we really need to be in the OCI path. And then LibBPF probably does not want to be in the OCI path at all. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> OK. I think uh, I but kind of. So, so like if you are, I don't know, writing this in Go, you can just like import whatever like helper we have in Tetragon, if, if, if that helps. So is there another place where you're already doing this, since it seems to be pretty common code for potential use cases? I mean, we have two, at least, that I'm aware of. So yeah. we, I, I think we do it in a couple of places, but yeah. like it's it's. If you are willing to use Go, which is like the language that Tetragon is written, you can Shouldn't, just like yeah. import import the function. Shouldn't and be a problem. And if yeah. it's not public, we'll just make it public. Like it's no problem. Okay, sounds good. Well, um, there were just a couple of other use cases which I was wondering was worth the justification of bringing this up, and uh, that's I think we already had our Q and A. <laughs> Thank you very much for all the suggestions and input, I think I had to connect with a few of you folks to get more info on this. Okay, okay, thank you. Thank you.